Welcome back to Screen Time. I'm Ro Khan. I'm Richard Roper. Before we get started, let me tell you that the digital landscape is changing rapidly, and to compete in today's business environment, you need an experienced partner. Since 1995, AmericanEagle.com has partnered with companies of all sizes, offering web design, development, e-commerce, mobile apps, digital marketing that drives your overall business success. Because they believe that today's online world is your opportunity. Visit AmericanEagle.com to get started today. Big Time at the box office for the Marvel folks. Yeah, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, Row. And we can talk a little bit about this and kind of do a review as we go along as well. Huge box office. So this is the, the Cumberbatch, Benedict Cumberbatch, yes. right? Yeah. And there was a Doctor Strange movie about four years ago. And I'll be honest with you, I, I, I know who Doctor Strange is, but I had to go back and watch the movie. Because and, and, then he's been in a bunch of other movie since then. Right, Spider-Man. Right? Yeah, yeah, well, the last one, the last Spider-Man uh, movie, he, it was his spell that sort of allowed the three Spideys to enter the multiverse. It's, mm-hmm. it's so fucking multi at this point. <laughs> uh, I don't believe that everyone knows exactly what's happening. If you do, you have to either be in prison or just, you know, what was that Super character's game. name? Mr. Glass in uh, Unbreakable, you know, with your own comic book store. Uh, and I did like the movie. It's very bizarre because it's directed by Sam Raimi who did some of the original Spider-Man movies, but he does movies like Evil Dead, like horror films. Yeah. So this has got kind of like a zombie element to it. There's like undead versions of Doctor Strange. It gets kind of dark, uh, kind of batshit crazy, but I love that it's doing well, Ro, because you and I have talked about this now for what? When did the pandemic start? 2011? I mean, it feels like... (laughs) I mean... I believe it's 1995. Jesus. Yeah, Yeah, it's been forever. And to see... And listen, we're, you know... We've said this a million times. It's not over, over, but people are going back to the movies. So the numbers I have for you that are kind of interesting is that it's going to do about $140 million here in the United States. By the time you hear this podcast, it will have done. You know, that's what the projection. So, but it's really kind of cool that it's done a quarter of a billion dollars internationally. Wow. They really don't care about the pandemic there. Well, it's well. This is what I wanted to get your take on because it, it's surprising to me. Well, I guess the Marvel movies do translate well, so to speak, right? And they have become more international. And there's a lot of times you'll see characters who represent different cultures, and that's done right. deliberately. But for example, it was the fourth highest opening ever in India for any movie. Spain, wow. they loved it in Spain. Uh, Mexico, almost twelve million dollars in Mexico. Brazil, seven million dollars, and Korea. They love it. $25 million. Wow. And I, you probably have to sit through like an opening reel to pay, you know, like showing that, you know, Kim Jong-un just, you know, golfed to seven <laughs> on an 18-hole course. And then, you know. Well, they're not showing it in North Korea. I'm no, they are not. Well, yeah. you know. I don't know. No, they're not. They're but, getting the knockoffs in North yeah, Korea, yeah. though. Well, they're then, getting the version where yeah. he's in it, you know, <laughs> where Doctor Strange keeps thanking the great one. What, what is this nickname? His royal yeah, asshole. Yeah. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Whatever. Yeah. But I think it's really cool. Um, you know, the numbers are, are big. UK, Mexico, Brazil, Japan, France, Australia, Germany. This is the one thing that we still have a United Nations that's united is Around our love level. of movies and, yeah. and the big movies. So, I mean, that, I think it's just great news. Uh, I, I am a cheerleader for movies. I'll tell you if I don't think it's good, but it's just good for the for the industry, you know. I, since we're having this conversation about Marvel and th- this incredible like, two-decade rise now, yeah. and it really yeah. kicked back off. Obviously, Marvel comics have been around forever. DC comics have been around forever. Sure. But... Marvel with Iron Man became this gigantic theatrical thing, and then, yeah, they, and then yeah. you know Kevin Feige came in, the great uh, yeah, you know, multimedia really master of this the, you executive know, yeah. who figured out how to how to get all the, the the mainline talent. I'm sure Robert Downey helped, you know, with that. I mean, there's everybody's got a piece. Sure, but yeah, Kevin Feige, you're right. I mean, he is the architect of the multiverse. I right. mean, it's the vision he has, and as you mentioned. Hundreds of people working on this, but to have a vision to say we're going to do this as a limited series, this is going to be animated. Mm-hmm. Uh, Doctor Strange is going to get his own franchise. Wait a minute, what about Black Widow? It, I could just, it, it must be the coolest thing in the world, but also that is a multiverse of, of imagination you have to have to put this all together and work from different comic books, you know, because in this one, Spidey's this way. And, and then cross yeah. them. And I know that and a then lot they of have this. The crossover, yeah. And, and everybody goes, well, you know, the original comic book in this particular. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Edition didn't say this. I know and, you're and, a big and, fan of that. And some of those people are actually, you know, the, those comic books that continue to get, or graphic novels or whatever you want to call them, 
I thought Fifty Shades Grey was a graphic novel. Novel. I didn't. I didn't get it. Well, but, it was in a way. Right? But it yeah. is. But the graphic novels, the comic yeah. books, whatever it is, they are informing the trajectory of this. But then you get people who get really upset about it. That uh, that's not what Doctor Strange said. Well, I, I, whatever. You know, I will tell you this: there are a couple people I follow on Twitter who are not in the business at all. They're not movie critics. They're not TV critics. They don't work. They work in like Indiana or they work in Ohio. It just because you look them up and they're like, oh, they're just but. They know more than I'll ever know. And it's actually very informative. Because they'll do some of that, but they'll also say, hey, everybody, relax. Actually, this happened in this comic book. So, it's, you know, there's always a, a, right. a precedent. Uh, They're it, sort of the, the high priests yeah, of Marvel. I, I love the passion. I mean, I don't particularly have that level. I don't care if something isn't true to a comic book plot line from 1967, or if it is, or which one it's based on. Is long, I'm, I'm all about the movie. I always tell people that. I don't review the books. I don't review the comic books. I don't review the graphic novels. I review what they turned right. them into. So if Marvel is on such a roll, and it is, and mm -hmm. should be, because it's high quality no matter how you look at it, even if you're not a comic book person or an action or fantasy fan, there's always something to like about those movies because they don't take themselves all that seriously. Yeah. There's a little bit of winking, but not too much that it takes you out. Mm -hmm. It's got, and it's it's fine. I mean, some of the, you know, at, at one point, everybody has to do jazz hands and then the whole city disappears and then it comes back. That, I mean, yeah. it, it, uh, you're seeing some of the same stuff over again. Yeah, but why is true. it, I'd like to know this, yeah. why is it that DC can't get its act together? Is it the magic of Kevin Feige? Is it the magic yeah, of just yeah, the role that they're it. on? Uh, you know, I think there's there's some hope now with the with the latest The Batman mm -hmm. with Robert Pattinson. I thought was a huge step in the right direction. So yeah, I'm rooting for them. Uh, it's funny you mentioned that because early on in the Doctor Strange movie, you know, this one eyed Cyclops creature is in New York and pursuing somebody, and he starts the creature starts throwing buses, and you know they, they're always throwing buses, right? And I'm thinking, the poor people of New York. How many times have they walked outside and someone's throwing buses? Yeah. And then they always have to show that one shot, even though the fight's been going on and like they're tearing up Manhattan, where there's a bunch of people in the office and they look out the window and somebody goes flying by and it's like, oh my gosh, that they somehow missed the <laughs> previous seven minutes. Uh, I want to say one more thing about this too, Ro, with, uh, with Doctor Strange and the multiverse of madness. And that is Elizabeth Olsen who you and I talked to when she was first coming up wow. like 10 years ago. That's true. Um, and she plays uh, Wanda, who's, you know, the WandaVision, which was, you know, the spinoff series and the Scarlet Witch. And she is a brilliant actress. And in this movie, you mentioned, you know, Doctor Strange is Doctor Strange. It's Benedict Cumberbatch and he's got a cloak and there's a bunch of him. She's playing someone who's grieving. And she plays it, you know, like, like as if she were in uh, a Kenneth Branagh film. Mm -hmm. You know, talk totally serious which works perfectly for her character so every once in a while as you mentioned robert downey jr you've seen it with some of the other actors you see real acting i mean crumberbatch is great but let's face it he could do this in his sleep he probably right. does he i bet he sleepwalks and still does the role <laughs> because he's been but he's like a method dude isn't he yeah isn't that's he like one of those thinking, super you know, serious yeah. like daniel day lewis yeah. kind of guys yeah he is and uh, listen i i think all of these actors certainly appreciate the paychecks i think in in, you know, behind closed doors with all the mics off some of them would be saying listen you know I didn't think this was going to be my career but I got 12 million dollars now I can go do the bard you know or whatever they want to do it's sort of what he's yeah. do doing anyway right didn't he, he got an Oscar nomination didn't he this year uh, yeah he was um, oh, uh, with fuck, the thing with the uh, mountains and the uh, and the people power of the dog yes, yes. The power of the dog the thing with yeah. the mountains that was the, <laughs> that was the original title well the problem I had uh, with that movie was that, saying, it was yeah. the wrong mountains yeah. I mentioned this I don't probably it the last you, or, yeah. the, the, the podcast before I just it was that was New Zealand I could tell that was New Zealand yeah, you took you right out of the movie yeah. and I'm not saying these actors don't respect the material I think some do more than others but you see you, you see almost everybody jumping on the bandwagon trying to get a piece of that including a lot of veteran actors you know michael douglas michelle pfeiffer whatever the case may be robert redford and a part of it is too like my grandkids will think i'm cool again but yeah. with robert Downey jr as you mentioned with his portrayal that you know that was an oscar nomination worthy portrayal in about four different movies and same thing with elizabeth olsen here all right all right I do love the Benedict Cumberbatch. He was just on Saturday Night Live. He's, he's very funny. Guy is incredibly funny. He's very self-reverential, which is what you have to be. Even though I think they're all faking that in Hollywood anyway. But it's it is great. I am, I have a sense of humor about myself. Sure you do. But he's, he did. He just he, he does. Was, yeah, he was funny. And he's hard. To, it, he's uh, he's hard to pin down as an actor because he's got great versatility. Uh, but he's also 
like strangely thin. Like he looks like he should be ill, but he's not. Yeah. He yeah, he's got a unique look, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah, there's no question about it. All right. Now I unfortunately do not have that I'm so thin, I look ill. Look, uh doughy, I think is the best way to describe it. But I will say this one of my passions is Portillo's. Let me tell you about our friends at Portillo's, the finest fast casual experience you're going to have in all of dining. Portillo's, you know, not just hot dogs. A lot of, you know, when it started in Chicago, people were like, oh, it's a hot dog shop. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. We got, we got Italian beef. Wait. We got Italian sausage. Wait. You got chocolate cake. <laughs> Oh man, it's just uh, it's just one of the great experiences you can have, and I, I think I just said this a couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. If you live somewhere where Portillo's is new in California, Arizona, parts of Florida, check it out. Go have the chocolate cake. You get a little slice of home if you're from the Midwest, you're from Chicago, or you're from the East Coast too, because you know that that food will be very familiar to you as street food. And I know what you're thinking. You're like, ah, oh, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, it's gonna be so heavy. It's not. Mm. And can I just tell you something? Mm. The best thing about Portillo's mm. is that bun that they put the Italian beef on yeah, yeah. that you get now when you get that dipped and it gets all wet. Yeah. That is the perfect piece of bread. Mm -hmm. And you know, carbs be damned. You can do it once a month. You're sure. not gonna hurt anything. You'll be fine. Portillo's.com. P-O-R-T-I-L-L-O-S is how you spell that. Portillo's.com. Find a store near you or order online, and you can get it anywhere in the United States of America, Portillo's.com. What's going on at Netflix? Netflix has lost subscribers for the first time in 10 years. It said last week they had lost 200,000 subscribers, uh, missing its own projections. It's interesting, too, because... You're, bro, you see all this kind of glee out there about this. I don't know why people don't want Netflix to succeed. They're not their success does not mean your failure, folks. You know, I, but I, everybody's always against the behemoth, whether it's Amazon, Google, Elon uh, Musk by Jovan, uh, whatever. <laughs> you know, I, and listen, I'm not saying some of it's uh, you know is warranted, but in this case, it's I, I, you know they they still have 222 million subscribers globally. And they cited a lot of things you and I have talked about. You know, people are sharing passwords like crazy. Right. And you also just get to a saturation point. And I would say in Netflix's defense, listen, the earnings are down and all that. They'll be fine. Uh, there are so many other streaming platforms out there. So people say, oh, man, Apple TV Plus has been kicking ass lately. Maybe I'll just stick with that. And a lot of people, I think they make decisions sometimes. They're like, you know what? We've kind of seen everything we want to see on Netflix. We don't need to see any more stand-up specials. Netflix continues to put out tons of product. But I don't think it's a big deal that they lost a couple hundred thousand subscribers. I think it's just still such a pain in the butt to get those DVDs out of the package oh, okay. and watch them and then send them back. I, all right. Legally Blonde 2 wasn't any good anyway. I'm sending it back. I, I, have, a, I, I have a theory, a very uh, complicated theory on this. I won't share the entire thing with you. It's mm. going to be in my uh, upcoming anthology of the history of media. But this is very similar to the cable wars mm. from the 1980s where everybody was deciding what they had especially the HBO Showtime you know pay cable wars where they everybody's paying a lot of money for content mm -hmm. and then they found that it wasn't paying off for yeah. them because they had, they were making bad decisions about what they were buying or what they were producing and then boom all of a sudden, in the 1990s, you had HBO just surge to the top because yeah. they decided they weren't going to go with just Howie Mandel specials. Nothing against <laughs> Howie Mandel, fan of the show, friend of our show, but he is a, uh, you know, he, he was one thing. I, I, Surgical Gloves was his comedy, sure. right? This move to cinematic television yeah. which was started by hbo and the, yeah. it's in not the 90s, deniable really. right yeah. yeah yeah i mean you know there were network specials and things like that before on the on the terrestrial networks but really in terms of the cable pay cable explosion we had sopranos the wire all those things mm -hmm. that came out sort of simultaneously and it was quality television not television yeah. it's hbo Right. Yep. That's what they used yep. to say. So Showtime then had to kick in and they were, you know, spending all this money. And then you had, uh, you know, Epics and all the rest of these other yeah. also rands that were trying to jump behind them. Well, now all of a sudden that cable model transitioned over to over the top. 
to yeah. the subscription services that you're going to get through the internet. Yeah. And they are finding themselves now, and Netflix did it because, you know, again, they went, you know, they were, the, they were the, I think they had VHSs too at one point, right? VHSs or have, DVDs yeah. or whatever. So the, the DVDs for sure, that was, you know, their, sure, their, yeah. pay, their, their mail in model, uh, you know, worked for a little bit because it was, it, it, it killed Blockbuster. It killed Blockbuster, yeah. Right? So now the question is, was, all right, what are they going to do? And they had to have original content because everybody else, if, if you had a hot movie or whatever, you were selling to everybody. Yeah. Right, didn't matter which over-the-top service you were going to sell to. Now there are contracts about where things can live, how long they can live. Everybody's gotten into it. Every billionaire, you know, there's what are there, there's 18 families that run America or something. Pretty I just read much. somewhere, and you know, those 18, you know, nine of them have over-the-top services. Yeah. Well, the other thing too is like with um, with Netflix, as you mentioned, and you know, Showtime and HBO are still big players. It took a while, but when Disney finally got in the game, Disney Plus, uh, when Amazon got in the game, I mentioned Apple TV Plus. It's taken them a few years, but now they are doing the a lot of the buzzworthy shows. You know, a lot of you know the big ticket Emmy nominated. So you know, Apple TV Plus has Ted Lasso, and Disney Plus has all these you know the Mandalorian and WandaVision and right. and. Moonlight and all this stuff. So they're carving, they're putting out really, as you mentioned, cinematic, great stuff. I can tell you as someone who has to watch everything or as much as I can, Ro, uh, and of course all the services send me this stuff, I still get confused sometimes because I'm like, is sure. this HBO or HBO Max? Now there's FX on Hulu, you know, which is a thing. But even something like, for example, Paramount Plus, which when it first came out there, I think they were like, we got friends, right? Isn't that why they did mm -hmm. the special? You know, but... But they then made their mark. Once you get like one prestige show that's a huge hit, and they got Yellowstone, and Yellowstone has like network better numbers than almost anything. You know, right. twenty million viewers. Kevin Costner, and now eighteen eighty three, the prequel. And that all of a sudden makes Paramount Plus a player because some people are so into those shows they're like, oh. And then you've got AMC, and they're saying, well, we got you know Better Call Saul. If you want to see, you know, the latest episodes. But then Netflix says, wait a minute, we got Ozark, you know, the finale. So it's an embarrassment of riches. I don't think it's hu it's a huge setback for Netflix to lose a few hundred thousand subscribers. I don't think so. It's not going to ruin them. They'll, they'll make, they'll pair off some things. They'll, they'll you know, move some executives along. <laughs> they'll do things that all these yeah. companies do. But that's the new world. That's the new reality. The yeah. epicenter of entertainment and anything that's put on film is those companies because yeah. those companies are now the big studios and some of them are related to studios and there were changes in the federal laws about how you could distribute films this goes way back this goes back to the charlie chaplin era mm. about, the government yeah. got involved in studios owning the movie theaters which owned the distribution systems and then as soon as television came around that became yeah. a separate issue so you couldn't actually own if you were a tv network like NBC, for example, they would go to Paramount to go get their television, mm -hmm. right? With Seinfeld or, you know, whatever it happened to be. Yeah. Now, what is interesting about that is now those rules are gone. Yeah. And so you are seeing these silos where Paramount is buying its own product back and it's holding on to that and it's developing it. But then Netflix, who doesn't really have that, that DNA of being owned by a major mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. entertainment company before... They're they're going out and picking these things up one at a time. Another one of the reasons that you know you're seeing you know where the the investment wonks that look at this stuff they're thinking well you know when that contract is up for you know you name it whatever the show happens mm -hmm. to be that's going to end up going back to its natural habitat mm -hmm. you know whether it's HBO which is its own network right studios assembly Warner Brothers. And then you have Comcast, NBC, Peacock is is uh, Jesus, universal, yeah. right? So those will all, all end up back under those silos. So that's where the real studio war is coming back 100 years later. That's crazy. And I hear from, you know, listeners, viewers, readers all the time, you know, saying, where where can I get this? And, you know, we now have an extra box, like in my Chicago Sun-Times review that just explains it. Because the other thing is, Ro... You know, like Netflix still believes in like, all right, here's the new season of Cobra Kai, all 10 episodes. Have fun. 
But Hulu's more like we're going to show you two on a Friday, right. the opening, and then one each day or each week. I, I listen. I get the binging thing. I kind of like it sometimes, but people get really mad because HBO is like, we're not doing that, man. HBO Max sometimes will. HBO is like, no, you want your one episode, you'll get it on Sunday night, and then you'll get well, another one in a week. Well, they're doing it now. So but people, you know, right. it, it's. I, I think that's a great discussion that a lot of I'm sure marketing and financial people have, like which model works better. Because some people get mad and they go, if I got to wait another week, I'm going somewhere else. They need, though, the buzz. The yeah. whole reason they yeah. do that is they need people to talk about it. And if you spread it out over the weeks and, and on a release time or date, not everybody has to watch it at, at you know yeah. 9 o'clock at night on a Sunday night, but you do have to watch it within 24 hours. People generally do, and then yeah. they're going to be talking about it amongst themselves on social media, exactly. you know, at the office, if anybody still goes to the office, whatever it is. Speaking of the office, the office is one of those things that it keeps moving around. It's one of those, yeah. those you know, high rewatchable like there's a yeah. there's a, a term they use for this yeah, repeatability yeah, so. rewatchable as you said you, absolutely and people yeah they, they will a lot of times you know with Netflix and they'll tell you this uh, you know if people spend more than about two minutes trying to decide what of the new content they want to watch they'll just default and go to an episode of a favorite television show or Correct. a movie they've seen before and Netflix does it what do you want to watch this again hey you started this what's wrong with you you know well, that's the problem. There's too much, too. Yeah, it, it's I mean, like, it, yeah, it's an abundance. To... There's there's brilliant television, and I do this for a living that I've never seen an episode of because there just aren't enough hours. And and then we we haven't even gotten in fact there's still in different in addition to the Marvel movies, a lot of great independent films and smaller movies, and they kind of are getting lost in this shuffle. True, because they're being overwhelmed, like they were before. Yeah, yeah. It, when you would go to Blockbuster. I mean, you walk into Blockbuster as I know you've done this professionally, so I'm not exactly sure however this worked for you. Mm. But uh, for those of us who who you know aren't forced to watch this because you've got a job to do to right. watch them, you'd go to a Blockbuster on a Friday afternoon or Saturday night or whatever it is to go. Okay, here's what we're going to watch for the weekend, honey. And you're just walking up and down the aisle. It's the same problem we have at yeah, Netflix, except that, you don't absolutely. have to leave your home. Yeah. No, you're 100% right. And I was always, you know, kind of of the mind where it's like I, I would do the research about what's opening and coming out on on you know, Blockbuster or whatever because you'd go to new releases. Of course, then if you didn't get there in time, they were gone because they only had four copies right. of Independence Day. And they're like, <laughs> well, why don't you try you well, know, that's, this one? That's true. And that's that's the beauty of this model is that you can have anything you want at any time. I just yeah. watch Major League Baseball on Apple TV. No. And that I found that, to be really interesting. I yeah. know that this is the second season, I think, of them doing this. Yeah. And it's I think it's really well produced. All of a sudden, I'm thinking now that's yeah. where we're heading anyway. So your cable, your, there was been this whole argument about, you know, is it better to have the pipes or the product? Ah, okay. And the whole idea of the pipes was, you know, are you going to go, who's going to be your cable provider? Who's mm. going to be your internet provider? Well, you know, that's all still merging together yeah. now because the content is, is going to be available, I think, on an a la carte basis moving forward. At some point, yeah. that's what you're going to head into, where you're going to decide, all right, if I want to watch this baseball game, it's going to be a buck ninety nine, and that's going to go to four ninety nine. It's going to go like like actual baseball tickets went. Yeah, well, it's interesting because you mentioned Apple TV Plus, and uh, you know, a lot of people the first week or two were like, wait a minute, this is the only place I could see the Yankees or the Dodgers on a Friday night. But you just need to have an Apple account. You don't have to sign up for Apple TV Plus to watch baseball. They may come at you at some point because I was telling people, no, if you, you just if you just have an Apple account because you've gone to the Apple Store, or you know, you know so in other words, yeah. you don't have to have Apple TV Plus. You can watch it right on your computer or you can hook up to your TV. And I, I know a lot of people have been ripping on it, saying, you know, I don't like the announcers. This that I'm like, you know, it's a little but bit. You do I do too? And they have kind of some different graphics and some yeah. different stats and everything. And why not? You know, a different approach. Yeah. I think it right. is interesting. I, and, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a, sort of an old soul, always have been since I was like five years old. And I, especially when it comes to things like baseball, you know, it's like the first sport yeah. you learn as an American yeah. boy. That's what you do. That's, you know, your dad's going out and you're, you're playing catch and you're, and you know. The most traditional, right. at least for, you know, going back generations is very different now. So I'm a traditionalist, essentially, when it comes to watching baseball on television and you know all these stats and everything that moves and it's things I don't even understand anymore. They're throwing so many stats at you and you want to see how fast the pitch is going, this and that. And and at first I'm like, oh man, do I really need this? And now you you become used to it. Yeah, you become used to all of it. And, and I think there's a whole new wave of of uh, announcer booth style that is out yeah. there where you know it's you know, there's still some teams. I think the Detroit Tigers still have. A, an announcer is like one guy 
Like yeah. the radio guy sits in the booth and talks to himself. This broadcast brought to you by the greatest cigar you'll ever have. Have right. a cigar, steak, and a martini, and then go visit your doctor. All <laughs> right, here we go. Major League Baseball. Right. If, if that's a night game. It's a little unusual. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. so, so Wake it, up. That, that's the point is yeah. that it, you, you just have to get used to it to, to decide that this is what you're going to go with. And I think Apple TV is doing a really nice job with baseball. And I think that's going to be the future. And I think we're going to start watching NFL football on a, and, and maybe it's I think a couple years away because the contract's coming up, but it eventually is going to be you'll be able to watch it anywhere at any time yeah. just by paying it like a ticket price. A ticket price. To and and to, to wrap that up, Ro, I will say this. Um, when it comes to baseball, and certainly when it comes to NFL football, people will find it. All the people that complain, right. I can't find this, I can't find that, they will find sure. it. Because as we've seen, no matter what the, whether it's ESPN, ESPN2, Fox, NBC, whatever the case may be, whoever has the Sunday night game wins the night. You know, it could be on, yeah, any kind of, uh, you know, obscure platform. It won't be obscure if the NFL's on there. We'd be remiss if we didn't mention this. Sometimes we tribute people on this program who've passed away, who you have seen for decades on television and in film, but you don't know their names. Mike Haggerty is one of them, one of the greats. Richard, please tell us how we know him. Mike Haggerty, who passed away last week, was a stalwart at Second City here in Chicago, where Roe and I are based. Uh, you know, was on stage for years with a lot of the greats, but also had this incredible career on TV and in films. And if you don't know the name, you'll know him. He was the classic Chicago character. He had the big mop of curly hair, the Ditka mustache, and the Chicago accent that he was not putting on right. because he was a Chicagoan. Uh, he most recently uh, played uh, Bridget Everett's father on HBO Somebody Somewhere, which I gave four stars to. Uh, you know, mostly dramatic, but a little bit of a comedic role. But if you're thinking, okay, I'm not so sure yet if I know who he is, uh, we could go through some of the things. I think a lot of people know him from Friends, right, Ro? He was the Mr. Uh, Trigger, the superintendent, right? Right, and there was a famous scene with uh, him I just and heard Joey. everybody go, "Oh, that guy!" Yeah, that, yeah. yeah. So here's a little bit of of uh, Mike Haggerty on Friends. You're clogging up the shoot. I just spent a half hour unclogging. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. I don't come in here a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course you don't, because you're a little princess. <laughs> Daddy, buy me a pizza. Daddy, buy me a candy factory. Daddy, make the cast of cats sing happy birthday to me. <laughs> What, you think you can just come in here, make a mess, a big man in the coveralls will come and clean it up, huh? Well, why don't you think of someone else for a change? <laughs> okay, Another sorry. very memorable role. And this is the thing about it, Ro. He would be on one episode or with friends. It was several episodes, but sometimes two or three scenes. And these are, and we just talked about how some of these shows have this repeatability. Seinfeld had one of the more, I think, popular episodes when uh, Kramer was going to team up with Jerry's dad, Morty, because he had the, the beltless trench coat, the raincoats, right? Right. And they were going to sell them to this guy at the thrift shop. He's gonna, they're going to make a fortune. Mike Haggerty played the guy at the thrift shop. And then downstream from Seinfeld, obviously, is Curb Your Enthusiasm as the Amco guy. The Amco guy, Mike Duffy. The reason I'm feeling bad is that, is that on the way home, Maggie mentioned something to me. You know what? On My wife home, never, um, never should have... Yeah. Never should have said that I didn't want people uh, to stay in the house with uh, this vineyard this yeah. summer. I actually, I was just going to apologize to you for sitting in your chair. That's what I wanted to talk to you about. I thought that might, maybe you should have sat at the head of the table. No, right? that's I, fine. I, I don't no, care that you no, sat not, there. Not, not in my no, chair, no, no, whatever no, you no, want. No, no, I, you know what? I like sitting. I like sitting over there. You should be able to sit in your own chair that. in your in your own house. Deal, my chair. So you know him, even though you didn't know him, and and it's very sad. He was only in his sixties that he passed away, but. It's really wonderful to see so many top actors, directors, and fans pouring in with their tributes and saying, you know, he was in Overboard with Goldie Hawn and Kurt Russell. Uh, he was the guy who got laid off in Wayne's World and was at the counter talking about it. He ha he had Every scene, he just came to play. Yeah. You know, and he was just in, you know, he'd be the kind of guy that they used to call them day players back in the day sometimes. Although he occasionally had some bigger roles, as I mentioned, with somebody somewhere, but just always, when you saw him, you're like, everything just got funnier and better. So when you have actors like him, and, and you know, there's a plethora of them, and you've seen them, some of them, uh, you know, came through Saturday Night Live, mm -hmm. others were, you know, stand-ups and improv guys uh, throughout the years, and they just are recurring. There's so much content out there that 
for them to be in. And when you see a scene and you see a guy like Chris Parnell pop up, you go, that's yep. going to be funny. That, that's a, that's it's going to work. You know, that's a very good uh, current example of someone that, you know, and listen, everybody wants to be a star or, you know, but sometimes I think, you know, these working character actors and actresses who put in 40 years and, you know, we could do six shows on them. Uh, they add so much and they're always... They're always very, almost always very popular on the set because people are like, oh, I get to work with this guy that was on this show and that show. And he's great. Right. They're the ones you know? that everybody's taking a picture with. Yeah. Including the stars yeah, of the absolutely show. Absolutely true. The Rowan Roper podcast is brought to you by AmericanEagle.com Studios. AmericanEagle.com is a full service global digital agency providing the best in class web design, development, hosting, digital marketing services, and so much more. Visit AmericanEagle.com for more information. On behalf of Renee Nelson and Tim Alanius, our executive producers, and Demita Menezes, our long-suffering production director, we'll see you next time.